This is 17 News with continuing coronavirus coverage. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Nicole Gitsky. Governor Gavin Newsom is streaming live every day at noon to give an update on the coronavirus crisis in our state. Yesterday, he hinted that he would be laying out a more of a plan for easing up on that stay-at-home order. Now, we will bring him to you as soon as he is available, but let's go to the latest on the coronavirus here in Kern County. Now, the latest numbers are out and they were released this morning. There are 692 positive cases, including nine non-residents. Four people have now died. 293 people have now recovered from that virus. Nearly 5,000 tests from COVID-19 have come back negative, but nearly 3,600 people are still waiting for their results. There are 351 cases in Bakersfield East, which includes much of Bakersfield, Arvin, Lamont, and other communities, and has the highest population in the county. 84 cases are in the Valley, 211 in Bakersfield West. There are 19 cases in the mountain areas and 18 in the desert areas. Well, now in your court watch, the latest on the Leslie Chance case. According to attorney Todd Lidget, she has been placed in a precautionary quarantine after someone in her housing unit at Lairdo Jail tested positive for coronavirus. Her attorney says the 53-year-old was not transported to court this morning for her scheduled sentencing hearing because of the lockdown in her unit. A new hearing date has been scheduled for May 20th. Now, Leslie Chance was a former elementary school principal convicted earlier this year of killing her husband. And new information on a deadly car crash in Arvin yesterday. CHP has identified the victim as 66-year-old Jose Garcia Sharon of Arvin. According to CHP, a car was going southbound on Fairfax Road, turned in front of an SUV traveling on Bear Mountain Boulevard. The SUV driver tried to avoid that car but was hit. Five people were inside and they were all taken to the hospital. Police say Garcia Sharon was not wearing a seatbelt. CHP officer Robert Rodriguez says the victims were farm workers heading to their jobs. No one in that other vehicle was hurt. Upcoming election this November will not be switched to 100% vote by mail ballots. The Board of Supervisors rejected that proposal at its meeting yesterday. The County Registrar of Voters, Mary Bedard, pitched her idea to transition the November election to 100% vote by mail. She says the COVID-19 pandemic could pose serious challenges to in-person voting. Bedard added that 70% of the ballots cast during the March 3rd primary in Kern County were in fact by mail. But in the end, most board members rejected that idea. It may cause significant confusion in people and that confusion could have impacts in our constituents confidence in our government. I'm confident in the integrity of our process. What I am not confident in is what we are witnessing is a changing of the way in which we run uh, the electoral process. And it is what it makes it more subject to is manipulation. Now, Bakersfield police pulls a woman from a flaming car after a crash in East Bakersfield. BPD says an officer was in the area of East California Avenue and Tulare Street just after one o'clock this morning when they heard the sound of a crash. Police say the driver plowed into an unoccupied business and sparked a fire. The woman behind the wheel was unconscious, so officers had to break into her car and get her out before the flames spread. She was taken to the hospital where she is expected to recover. The cause of that crash is under investigation. And fire crews are investigating another fire that broke out in a building in Northeast Bakersfield late last night. According to Pulse Point, the fire was reported just after 1030 at a building near Health Engineering Incorporated on Union Avenue and Quincy Street. Outside of the building is charred. We're working to learn whether anyone was hurt and what caused that fire. We will bring you the latest details as they become available. Well, after five months, Bakersfield finally has a new police chief. Today is Greg Terry's first full day as Bakersfield's new police chief after he was selected yesterday by new city manager Christian Clegg. Terry, of course, has been serving as interim chief since December when Lyle Martin retired and became chief investigator for the district attorney's office. Terry said he plans to continue and expand on some of the 21st century policy policing strategies that Martin put in place. Stay with us. We're back after this. 
I'm sure you all are wondering since I got ahead of myself, Wendy's is giving away free food nugs instead of hugs. Well, what does that mean? The fast food chain took to Twitter to tell people they can score free chicken nuggets this Friday. When he says it wanted to do something good after seeing the outpouring of love during the coronavirus pandemic, drive through customers can get a free four piece order of spicy or crispy chicken and they don't have to buy anything. Other fast food chains are also offering special deals during the pandemic. Now we do have Governor Gavin Newsom and again he is going to touch on possibly a layout for when we can start easing those stay at home orders. Let's take it over to him and hear what he has to say. To organize around six specific themes and teams to every single day monitor conditions on the ground. It's driven not by ideology uh, but by argument, by evidence and by the curation of best practices, not just across the state, across the country, but from around the rest of the world. Uh, we led with that first indicator that we'll talk about more in a moment around testing, uh, tracking, tracing, isolation, and quarantine. Uh, but we included in five additional indicators, considerations uh, that we must around making sure we protect the most vulnerable Californians, our seniors in skilled nursing facilities, nursing homes, assisted living centers, uh, those that are vulnerable out on the streets and sidewalk, the homeless, uh, people with compromised immune systems. Send that laid out framework for our second indicator, how we protect the most vulnerable. The third indicator was around hospital capacity, healthcare delivery capacity, not only within the hospital system, but the creation and the opportunity uh, to provide alternative care sites and facilities. To do so, not just with physical assets, but to make sure we have the human resources, the people, and the protective gear uh, to make sure that the health workers are healthy and safe at the same time. We had a fourth indicator uh, around the issues of therapeutics. We talk a lot about herd immunity, and vaccines. Uh, we in California are uniquely positioned because of the National Institute of Health for the top 10 uh, funded NIH sites are in the state of California. Uh, we are blessed and endowed with some of the finest research institutions and hospitals uh, doing therapeutic studies and advanced uh, therapeutic uh, partnerships in this state. It's non well, it's respectfully among the most robust of any state in this nation. So therapeutics also is a category that guides our decision making. Uh, the issue, obviously, of businesses, issues related to schools and physical facilities uh, is another area uh, that guides our consideration. That's indicator five. Uh, I've made it clear in the past that uh, we won't just open things. We'll have to open things and modify how we conduct our business, how we uh, educate our kids, how we take care uh, of our children. And we talked about floor plans just a week ago and what that looks like in terms of uh, practicing physical distancing as we begin to process the considerations uh, for reopening uh, the economic uh, sectors in our society. And finally, the issue of what happens if we overcompensate. Overtacked. What happens if we get ahead of ourselves and we start to see uh, a surge of new cases, hospitalizations, people in ICUs? What's our capacity to reinstate some of these conditions and hot spots and our capacity uh, to project some confidence in doing so and confidence in you that doing so uh, is appropriate uh, and you'll abide by those rules at the same time? Because we are not lost on us trust is the most important commodity in these conversations. Building uh, that trust with you, 40 million Californians, to make sure we're continuing uh, to practice physical distancing, social distancing, and abiding by uh, these guidelines, recommendations, and directives. Uh, but we recognize we're testing that trust every day uh, because of the deep desire for people uh, to begin to know when they can get back to work, when they can uh, go back out and recreate and enjoy the beautiful parks and beaches uh, in the state of California. And so today uh, we want to uh, further that conversation. Uh, I want you to know you'll be left wanting if uh, you uh, woke up to this uh, discussion and we're going to hear that we're reopening large sectors of our society. Uh, we're not prepared to do that today. Uh, I very much look forward to making those announcements and we won't wait week to week to make those announcements. When we're ready, we'll make those announcements in real time. 
but I am ready today to make the following announcement. Uh, we have been working with our partners in Washington State and Oregon, uh, guided by uh, their experts and guided by their examples and helping us to inform our own efforts here in the state of California. And based upon Indicator 3 and the work that we have done together in providing alternative care sites, the incredible work that the hospitals have done to decompress uh, their existing facilities and provide capacity uh, to increase surge and the incredible workforce that's been assembled. Uh, we are in a position today uh, to begin to pull back uh, and lean in uh, by beginning to schedule surgeries once again uh, throughout not only our hospital system but our broader health care delivery system. Uh, these are uh, surgeries that, yes, are scheduled but also are essential. Uh, tumors heart valves, uh, the need for people uh, to get the kind of care that they deserve. It's, if it's delayed, it becomes ultimately denied. It gets delayed, it becomes acute. Uh, and that's fundamentally is a health issue. And so beyond just the issue of uh, the virus, uh, we are working with our health directors and throughout the health care delivery system uh, to reintroduce uh, the capacity to get these scheduled surgeries uh, up and running again. We will be very thoughtful and judicious about how we do that. Uh, we will not overload the system at peril of not being able to maintain our surge capacity. Uh, and we recognize any time we begin to toggle back and start opening things back up, we have to look every day at the data, the dashboard of information coming back to make sure that we are adjusting to these uh, new decisions and maintaining an understanding that we need to be vigilant about the intended consequences of these decisions and the unintended consequences of these decisions. So if you are asking yourself, well, how can we guarantee if we're bringing back all of these scheduled surgeries that there'll be availability if we see a second wave or a large surge uh, as we start pulling back that we have capacity? Uh, we are monitoring that, and that's foundational in terms, again, of this dimmer, not light switch, that we are advancing in terms of just beginning to shift things but recognize that that shift, that dial, can be turned up or that dial can be turned back in real time. But this is, uh, for us, a significant uh, health-first focused announcement today to begin to augment the stay-at-home order, but to do it uh, with an eye on public health and making sure we secure the safety uh, of our health care delivery system, and that includes the workers, uh, making sure we always are providing care to the caregivers, keeping our health care workers healthy at the same time. So that is uh, the announcement we wanted to make today as it relates to a modification of that stay-at-home order that is determined by adaptive decision-making that is foundationally focused on the indicators giving us that green light, informed by the indicators. Accordingly, uh, we wanted to talk about another indicator. Again, I referenced a moment ago the issues of testing and tracing, which will be foundational uh, to our broader efforts to get to those other indicators and when retail stores open, uh, when recreational opportunities uh, be, uh, are made available again. The testing becomes foundational in that effort. The tracing becomes foundational uh, in that effort. Uh, I have a number of things I want to add to that discussion. And while it is true that we have provided testing for 465,327 individuals, uh, that number is still inadequate uh, to meet the needs uh, of all of you and to meet our expectations as it relates to our capacity uh, to begin uh, to move even further uh, in terms of augmenting and modifying these stay-at-home orders. So 465-plus thousand tests have been done. We went from 2,000 tests on average a day in March, just a few weeks ago. We made announcements with a new testing task force uh, that committed to advancing that number to 10,000 by April 14th. Uh, just a few days ago, we announced we're actually at 14,500 tests a day. Right now, we're about 16,000 tests a day. Forgive me 
for building all these numbers, perhaps confusing you, except to say from 2000 at the end of March to now a goal by the end of April of 25,000 tests. 16,000 on average today get to 25,000 by the end of this month. Our goal is north of 60,000 tests a day. And that's phase one goal. That's a short-term uh, goal. Over the next number of months, we want to have a minimum of 60,000 tests. Uh, we're hoping to get closer to 80,000. So it's 60 to 80,000 is the framework, the minimum being 60,000 tests a day. Our entire PCR test, that's the swab-based test, capacity to instruments that exist in the state of California, if 100 percent were at full throttle and everybody was being tested because we had all the supply chains uh, intact and ready to go, be about 95,000 tests. We can conduct a PCR test. These are not the serological tests. I'll get to that in a moment. But the PCR test, the swab-based test uh, that many of you recognize, the instruments have the capacity to get up to 95,000. We believe that we can get not only the 25 shortly, uh, but get to that 60 to 80,000 range uh, within our existing framework of expectation of when supplies are coming in, uh, when more equipment uh, will avail themselves, and when more sites uh, present themselves in communities all across this state. And that's something else I wanted to share with you. We are significantly increasing the sites of availability at the same time. We're increasing capacity within the existing system. There are hundreds and hundreds of testing sites in the state of California, um, well, well in excess of 600. But there are 251 core sites that really make up the backbone of our testing system in the state of California. We did detailed surveys of those 251 sites about what they need to increase capacity. Uh, 50 to 55 percent uh, of those that we surveyed said their number one need is swabs. Others suggested they need viral transport methods and the old media uh, that is used to take the swab and put it uh, into a little kit and send it uh, off to be diagnosed. The diagnostic side, less stress, though always critical, uh, the RNA extraction, the reagents, uh, substantially many of those roadblocks have been lifted. Still an issue, but not as significant as half of those that were surveyed saying it's really now uh, getting the specimen that's the bigger issue with our testing capacity. I just got off the phone with President Trump less than an hour ago. We had a very specific conversation about not just the survey but the need for swabs, a very pointed and honest conversation. Uh, and the president uh, secured and gave me the confidence that we will receive just this week a minimum of 100,000 swabs. And that's the ability to collect 100,000 specimen samples. That will be forthcoming to the state of California this week. He said then we will be provided 250,000 swabs next week. And he said third week, expect to see a substantial increase above the 250,000. Uh, that was a very good phone call. I want to thank the president not only for uh, being available for a phone call at a moment's notice, uh, but being willing to directly commit to all of us in the state of California to a substantial increase in supply of these swabs. That will go a long way to give us all more confidence that we can meet uh, some of these testing goals, these stretch goals, and assuage the concerns uh, around those 251 sites uh, that have reported a need uh, for more swabs. So that specifically uh, is uh, an advancement uh, on our commitment to do more in this space, but we have a second commitment. Uh, that we are making public today uh, to do more, and that's a commitment to make sure all Californians are tested. What I mean by that is not all 40 million of us uh, would be ideal, but in every part of the state where we're not leaving communities behind. One of the big struggles we have had in the last few weeks of this pandemic is getting to rural and remote parts of this state and getting up testing sites and making them available. One of the other vexing and frustrating things, is getting into our urban centers 
and making sure that we're getting into black and brown communities and doing justice uh, to people that are also underserved, even uh, in these remarkably enriched and robust and well-resourced communities. And so today, uh, we are announcing 86 new sites that will become operational that are focused from a socioeconomic lens, focusing on black and brown communities, and focusing on rural communities. We've put together a heat map of the state where we define testing deserts. And we're going to begin to plug uh, these programs into these sites. You just heard the latest from Governor Gavin Newsom. He did say that we are not prepared to reopen, but they are working on shifting things and pulling back restrictions. That includes they are going to, again, schedule surgeries for those who need it. He did mention that 465,000 tests have been conducted here in California. When the beginning of March came about, they were doing about 2,000 a day. Now they are doing 16,000, and their goal is to be doing 60,000 tests a day. Governor Newsom also mentioned he talked with Trump earlier today, and Trump has vowed that we will get 100,000 swabs to California this week, another 250,000 by next week. That means as of this week, we will be able to test another 100,000 individuals. Now, they're also making sure we are not leaving communities behind. They're calling them testing deserts, those that are in rural areas, maybe those affected by socioeconomic lenses. Now, they were adding 86 new sites for those to be tested across California. Now, you can continue watching Governor Newsom's whole live stream on our Facebook page. This is 17 News with continuing coronavirus coverage.